joining me. I'm Victor Hanna, um, aka Glyph, uh, for those that know me. Uh, I currently work as an IT researcher with a redacted organization. Um, it's really so cool to be speaking at DEF CON on behalf of IT Village. I can't say just how uh, excited I am to kind of be part of this whole uh, thing. So thank you for, for having me and uh, taking the time to listen um, to my talk. I'm going to be taking you through um, a, the Magic Home Device Takeover and Authentication Bypass vulnerability that I uncovered uh, late last year, end of 2020 that is. Um, I've entitled this uh, particular package Lead Light Lunacy because, you know, at the end of the day we were kind of all in lockdown and we are going absolutely bonkers and crazy. So um, it's kind of just a way in which I used to jump out of that whole insane asylum type of scenario. And, and I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, let's just jump straight in. So the journey to Lead Light Lunacy started with my attempt to literally blighten up things for my two kids during the extended lockdown period. Um, I decided that I'd look around to see what was available out there on the market, so I purchased um, an off-the-shelf uh, lead strip uh, light device that um, you know, I thought would act as, as a way to brighten up their day-to-day their -day as they found themselves um, you know, uh, having to deal with extended periods of, of indoor life. Um, so, so why lunacy? Why is it lead light lunacy? Well, um, for me it was because I was kind of getting bored. I was, I was kind of being bored, uh, senseless, senseless myself. Um, I was kind of tethering on the, on the edge of, of going crazy. And I needed something to sink my teeth into too. So it was basically just a, um, an honest attempt to uh, do something around the house. But as I, as I found, it turned into um, a curious case of IT research. Um, and I basically decided that I wanted to try and tease out any weaknesses within the device um, because, you know, I thought it'd be cool. I thought it'd be something different and, and a great way to spend my time um, uh, in the process. And eventually it kind of ended up uh, with a verified CV at the end of it uh, based on um, the inevitable vulnerabilities that I was able to find within this particular device. So what is this product? Well, it's simply just a little light strip. <laughs> as simple as that. So the little light strip itself, um, and it's designed that the little light strips themselves have a an adhesive backing, uh, and they can be adhered to um, a surface of your choosing. So it will be at a wall, a door, uh, whatever it might be, you know, a teddy bear. Um, and basically, once surface mounted, um, you know, you can control the the blinking and the on on and off of the um, the little light strips themselves. Um, and this is basically just a, a quick product description uh, that I found that was um, advertised on the, on the website that I f stumbled across. Um, and of course you'll notice the uh, plug and play functionality which is really scary on the onset, right? So, got my hands on the product itself. And I went about surface mounting the LEDs uh, to an appropriate part of their, of their room. They, they kind of share a room at this point in time, so uh, it wasn't hard to kind of um, I didn't have to run up between rooms or anything like that. It was essentially their, um, uh, the single room that they occupy. Um, connect the LED strips to basically a 12-volt step-down transformer. Um, and then I kind of went through the motions of uh, attempting to surprise them, you know, to surprise the kids as to, you know, um, as to look, 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 look what that has done. Um, you've been asking me for a while, and, and uh, voila, here, here, is, uh, here is the product of my uh, hard work. So as you'd expect um, in the age of instant gratification, um, their interest was perked for uh, really not that long. Um, but nevertheless, I figured I did my good deed of the day. I smiled and then I moved on. Um, so the next item on the agenda was for me uh, was to basically see if I could break these things. Okay, so now to, to uh, in order to break the things, we need to know how the things actually function. And we need to kind of... Um, do that in such a way that we've, uh, you know, documented um, uh, what available components um, there are to, to actually um, uh, to use as attack vectors. So, attack surface mapping, which is what where I moved on to, to next, was essentially the um, it's just a simple way of describing the components that are used within the system. 
um, and, and how these components are used to either control or interact with the system itself. So it's basically one of those things that's really initially um, really useful for a security researcher in order to understand what um, um, potential attack vectors exist um, and you know where you want to where basically you want to pour your efforts in, in terms of teasing out weaknesses. So as I could see it there were th basically three kind of avenues to go down, three categories, three techn technology categories. Um, one of which was uh, IR and kind of messing around with discrete codes and you know in close proximity to the actual device itself. Um, I kind of considered that one a little less of a priority because I wanted to have kind of a further reach. I wanted to have something that was um, um, potentially uh, remotely exploitable. So from at this point in time, IR was kind of off the agenda. Um, and then obviously you had the Wi-Fi, which the, the lead light strip controller itself um, basically tethers to the home Wi-Fi or home or other Wi-Fi segment and. Um, you know, once you're associated, you can actually then start controlling the LED lights um, using uh, the, the, the mobile app application. So the Wi-Fi and the mobile application became kind of targets of interest, and that's where I poured my next efforts in terms of um, kind of examination and research. And here what I'm illustrating is the attack surface map that I put together. Um, as you can see, um, you know, the mobile application is running essentially on a mobile handset or a handset itself um, and it's attached to a, an internal Wi-Fi segment which also the LED light strip controller is as well um, so that's kind of two points of interconnect there um, once you have the basically the registered uh, LED strip controller um, associated with the mobile application um, you can then control it over a, a cloud API um, and that gives you that therein lies the kind of remote functionality or the remote um, uh, methodology in which to uh, control the device from a remote location. So that's that. And so speaking of which, um, i.e. the mobile application, um, this is the uh, targeted mobile app that I tested, which is um, Magic Home Pro 1.5.1. Uh, and that's the one that I kind of uh, was able to tease uh, out the vulnerability on. Um, it's basically the, the mobile app itself is obviously where a lot of the heavy lifting is is done in terms of functionality around this um, system. So, you know, make it made a whole bunch of sense to um, pour efforts into working out what was under the hood of this particular application. So I moved moved on to that as the next point of call. So in order to do that, I um, just want to take a little sidestep here, just to kind of um, illustrate um, basically the tool sets that um, can be used and are typically used on a, pe on a, a pen test or an engagement um, to actually um, uh, tease out vulnerabilities within mobile applications. Um, we have Frida. Uh, Frida is an invaluable tool that allows you to uh, hook processes, as we all know, it's uh, it kind of comes in handy when you want to um, target a process on a within a particular application, um, and you, you can use it for things like you know SSL pinning bypasses, for example, which is which is kind of uh, most typically where a lot of people would use it. Um, burp suite, which shall go, um, you know, without. I mean, its its reputation precedes itself. I think everyone. Every man and his dog knows what uh, Burp Suite is all about, but essentially it's a uh, proxying HTTP um, application that allows you to manipulate, you know, uh, transit flows um, just to see what's kind of uh, happening um, in terms of the uh, under the hood types of activity. Um, Jenny Motion is awesome. Uh, Jenny Motion is just a, an Android emulator, not just an Android emulator. It's a pretty damn cool Android emulator, but it's kind of cooler in the sense that um, you know, if you don't have a rooted Android device on hand, you can actually then um, use Jenny Motion to run up a whole bunch of sandboxes um, with the app that you're interested in uh, in targeting. And uh, JD GUI, which is uh, what you would do is you would normally take an APK, uh, you would convert, uh, convert that to, to Java, and then throw the Java into JD uh, GUI uh, to then have it decompiled um, into class files, and then that, at that point you can then uh, tease out um, 
uh, functions and classes that you're interested in and work out how they, how they work. Uh, and then possibly reverse engineer them if you have to. And again, so with all each of these particular um, applications, tool sets, um, obviously the deservant of a talk in and of themselves, um, but uh, I'll leave it at that for um, kind of just a precursor to that. So I pulled out uh, Jenny Motion from the, the, tools, the toolkit and I um, uh, threw the APK, the mobile application, into the um, uh, I pushed it onto the device, and onto the virtual device, and I started having a look at it through an intermediate proxy to kind of um, work out what I could see from a transit, but from an interesting traffic perspective, you know, some HTTP flows, for example. So I did capture some of those. I did capture the authentication flow, and um, what I noticed uh, upon uh, further analysis was uh, this particular HTTP request, which, um, as you can see, uh, basically um, has inbuilt as one of the parameters the, the MAC address of the, the device that you're um, interrogating. Uh, it also has a couple of other really important, um, which will be really important later on when it comes time to um, manipulating this actual uh, application. But those are uh, the binded unique ID which is associated with every individual endpoint, uh, the un user uh, uni ID which is um, unique to each user, as the name implies. Um, the username, which again is unique to each user, and that's, that's there as a part of a kind of a, uh, an email uh, uh, parameter. And um, last but not least, the, uh, the token, which is in our case a, a JSON web token. And that particular JSON web token is, um, pays, play, please pay special attention to that because that's kind of where we um, are able to um, um, what we're able to use to manipulate the actual program at some point uh, at a later stage. So, so using using BERT, um, I, I normally want to. I normally go about the um, the emotions of trialing um, uh, trying different vectors from the perspective of the, the web application itself. And in this case, I um, after a few other attempts at looking at some things, I landed upon a. Uh, a potential idol vector, right? And so an idol, for those that are, are unaware, is, is essentially an insecure data object reference, and just means that I'm able to manipulate a, an object directly outside the application. That's essentially what that means. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to, I chose the, the MAC address as my fuzzing target. And so what I wanted to do was take the organizational unit um, and um, fuzz for potential serial numbers um, off the back of that as a um, suffix to the organizational unit um, and see to see what I could tease out in terms of um, potential MAC addresses that fit within that in that format. Um, so this is the script that I put together and this essentially just shows the um, the um, the output of that particular effort. And what you'll notice coming back is, a, a, you know, using utilizing my level of authorization, it seems that I'm now able to, using the MAC address as the fuzzing target, I'm able to retrieve user, unique ID, unique ID, and the binded ID of each of those, um, each of those devices. Okay, so wait, what does that mean basically? It just means that I'm able to enumerate every connected device around the world, which is cool. And you know, that's kind of what I thought I would, um, what, what would uncover by, by doing this. But at the end of the day, what it does mean is that potentially two to the 24 devices are, are affected. And that's really the, the, um, the part that um, we should be focusing on in terms of, based on my level of authorization, um, I'm now able to see every single connect device. And that's where lies the authorization, authorization flow itself. Okay, so um, if I can do that, what else can I do? And that was kind of where I um, uh, moved on to next. So next I have, um, um, I wanted to delve into some of those other JSON parameters that I showed you uh, previously in the previous slide. Um, and based on the fact that it looks like we've got an authorization flow, um, I wanted to poke around and see what else I could do with the, with the current level of authorization. So 
at the current level of authorization, which kind of was common sense, I was able to uncover the the actual um, hex data that was used to actually turn on the LED lights and the hex data that was used uh, to turn off the LED lights. So um, I knew that that was probably potentially something that I could um, um, use. And what I wanted to see was whether or not I could do that, not only for my device that I was in, in control of, but obviously the based on the eye door that we previously uh, looked at, uh, can I do it with um, a MAC address uh, that's not mine? You know, and basically it, it um, turned out that the answer to that question was yes. So I could actually turn on and turn off the lights that were uh, connected uh, around the world. And that was kind of, I, I thought it was kind of cool. So I'm a Python freak, so I put together another Python just to, uh, and what, what you're seeing here is essentially the Python that I put on that illustrates that um, sending those hex codes does actually turn on um, and turn off the actual uh, LED lights themselves. So this is what this is showing you um, in the script that I wrote. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's that. So just moving on and, and delving a little further, um, given the fact that we it looked like that we were kind of dealing with um, a weak authorization, I wanted to turn my attention back to the the data within the JWT uh, to look in, into the, the structure of the payload that, of the data section. Um, and as it turns out, two or four um, of the parameters um, are encoded into the section, and those are um, the uni ID and the user ID. Um, so what I wanted to try and do was, using the authorization flaw, I wanted to try and see if there was a way that I could actually reassign the JWT with um, the parameters that actually weren't uh, parameters that weren't actually mine. Um, so what I did was I stumbled across uh, a well-known JWT signature bypass vulnerability that basically allows us to um, downgrade um, the JSON Web Token to an algorithm of none. Uh, within within the the, the, the the header section of the token, um, and basically what that says, what that does is it simply just translates to the ability to now be able to sign, re-sign actually um, JWT um, or JSON tokens um, without the need to to uh, re-verify or re-sign the actual um, signature. So the, the signature, as you'll see, is is uh, is an important part of that. So basically. Um, as I said before, I wanted to use the JWT um, vulnerability to see what we could um, achieve in terms of our authorization level. Um, but before I do that, I just want to discuss um, basically pulling apart the JWT itself. Um, as you can see, um, the anatomy of a JWT uh, consists of basically three sections. Um, the first section being the header section, which um, just shows you the, um, the algorithm that's being used. Uh, and the type of um, token that it actually is, and, and you know, as in our case, it's the J, uh, the JSON Web Token itself. Um, but then it also shows the uh, it obviously includes the the payload section, uh, and that payload section is um, a way in which to um, uh, detail the claim that you're trying to uh, invoke using the um, using the JWT itself. Um, it's basically data transmission. Um, through the payload section, it's the data. It's the data part of the actual uh, token itself. Um, you know, there are different um, uh, claims that you can um, make about the payload section. Um, they consist of um, you know registered claims, which are basically those that are um, reserved. So an example of that might be like an issuer claim, so an ISS claim. If you if you've seen that um, in your passing, in your travels. Um, there's also a public claim, which is a, um, a claim that's you know um, uh, created by the developer, and that could be something like you know a username, for for example. So anything that the developer that might want to put into this part of the this, the part of the payload within the actual JWT, and private claims, which are um, normally kept private between producer and consumer of the uh, the token itself. Then you notice that the uh, the verified signature. So the signature section is essentially just an HMAC, okay? And um, it's it's uh, as a matter of the header, payload, and secret, um, and is used basically to verify that the data contained within the JWT hasn't uh, is 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 basically verified. So what happens there is each of those sections is base sixty four encoded and concatenated together 
um, to create the, the JWT itself. Okay, so that just illustrates what a JWT is and um, what we're doing, what we're illustrating here is another Python that I put together to actually um, see if we could forge one based on the actual information that we have. So obviously you can see here, just my email address and my uh, unique ID, I uh, created a Python that actually forges the JWT for us um, and whose output then is um, a nicely kind of formatted um, uh, JWT token here that you can see in the um, in, in a, um, a HTTP response that will become a little clearer uh, later on in this in this talk. But uh, essentially, if you look at this, you'll see that the JWT itself is now forged, which is that guy there. Okay. Okay. So now that we've got that newly forged JWT, this is just showing us. Um, uh, that we can now use that forge JWT to um, alongside the hex codes that we spoke about before, which turn on on and off the actual LED lights, um, and we can actually turn on and off the LED lights. So using the JWT, that's kind of what I wanted to try and achieve um, in this in this in this uh, instance. So it's just using BERT to uh, send a request using the forge token, and then the the output is the uh, the LED lights going on and off. So um, we can turn the lights on and off, like big deal, right? Okay, so what else can we do? Like it's something that, um, you know, as you peel the, the layers of the onion away, you find that um, there are more and more uh, things that uh, could potentially be, be used, right? So one of, those, one of those operations, one of those things that I wanted to explore using the Forge token was actually the sharing of the device with a friend. Um, so I want to work out whether or not we could actually um, uh, potentially take over the, the device using this method. Um, to my surprise, and um, the answer was yes to that uh, question, so what this is showing is um, another script that I put together which takes into consideration um, the attacker's email, the um, target's email, um, the target's uh, MAC address, and the forge token. Um, and based on that, we uh, now that the device is under our control, uh, we can now see within the actual um, application itself that uh, we have now control of the LED lights uh, using our logged in user. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, with all those uh, um, individual snippets now sewn in into our brain, um, this kind of slide just shows us the inevitable authentication bypass that the CVE was uh, granted for. Um, and basically what we're doing here is um, the, uh, the CVE um, is, uh, allows for an authentication bypass of the uh, mobile application itself and, and in order to do that, you, the, as I mentioned previously, that forged uh, script that I put together is what this particular edit response is. So this flow of traffic we're seeing is essentially the um, authentication flow. And what we're doing is we're uh, providing the application with a bogus password, which is basically a password of nothing. Um, and we are providing it with the user ID that we're trying to take over, which we got from our um, enum uh, previously. Um, the response we get is this particular thing, which is the account doesn't exist, which means, in other words, the password was wrong. And what we do is we, with the forged token, um, we can then edit that response and gain access to the actual uh, application as that user. So essentially we're bypassing the authentication, in this case the, specifically the password itself. So that, that, that's kind of cool and that's uh, inevitably what we uh, set out to achieve was teasing out the, the uh, weakness within the actual application um, that would allow us uh, an attacker to take control of the actual LED lights. And in this case we have um, fully uh, uh, made that happen. Uh, so this slide is just showing us the um, um, snapshot of the authentication bypass itself, as I was uh, alluding to. Um, it's basically the, the script that I put together that uh, takes into consideration um, the, um, uh, the, the user account that we want to take over. Um, and the um, uni ID that we um, uh, are looking to uh, 
uh, take over as well. Um, we port that stuff into a script and we get a, a, an output which is the um, forged JWT and, and HTTP response that we require to actually authenticate, to bypass the authentication. So this is just showing us that I'm not lying, that I can actually take over an account. Um, and it's just showing essentially um, me trying to log in uh, as, a, as a user, as a user that I'm trying to attack. Um, I've given it a, a bogus password. I then run my script in the background um, and edit the HTTP response. Um, and I'm sorry for the blurring, but then basically this logs me in as that particular user. And I'm just showing you uh, what that looks like from the perspective of an attacker. So what I've got here is, um, what I normally uh, uh, do on you know, any type of engagement is kind of work out what's happening um, on the ground in terms of network uh, segment that I'm attached to, for example, anything that might be interesting um, in terms of network traffic that uh, I, I could potentially target. Um, in this case, I want to be specific about the Magic Home Pro application itself. So I put together basically a sniffer that um, allows us to um, intercept any relevant traffic that's specific to home, uh, the Magic Home Pro um, application. And all this slide is showing us is um, the script that I'm, I'm using that will essentially utilize EDICAP as the man in the middle. Um, it automates both the uh, IP forwarding, uh, sets up EDICAP as you'll see here, um, it then looks like it finds a device, which is uh, this particular device here, um, and it then adds that device to a loot, um, which you can then reference later on. So essentially you can have this particular sniffer sitting on a network um, uh, looking for, uh, you know, if, if that's what you're, uh, if, that you're, if, that, if you're that way inclined and you essentially want to attack a lead light script, then uh, you can uh, utilize this particular script to um, uh, enum and harvest uh, a whole bunch of um, uh, Magic Home Pro devices uh, that then get added to a loot that you can then take away with you and attack uh, at a later date. So um, uh, this is basically just showing you um, that. So what I do now is I um, I go to the attack uh, menu item. Um, it then allows me to uh, punch in the MAC address that we found um, that was added to the loot, which I'll, I'll, I'll punch in here. And then at that point, I now am doing a similar thing to what I was doing before, which is basically taking over the device from the perspective of on off, on off, on off. So that's what you're seeing uh, at that level. Okay, so awkward silence. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so that brings me to my first end of my first ever DEF CON presentation. Um, huge thank you to uh, both DEF CON and IT Village for allowing me to participate in the event. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for allowing me to share my content with you all. Um, for those on the ground this year, have a real blast. Bummed that I can't be there in person, but I'm hoping to be there next year in, um, to, to share the experience. Um, please feel free to uh, connect with me on Twitter. Uh, please check out the uh, Spiderlabs and Adify blogs. Uh, and last but not least, uh, inspire and be inspired. Thank, thank you to you all.